Dr. Randy Douglas, and I think I've met most of you, I think, at one point in time or another. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the eye component of this disease, but also how it bridges the gap um, as far as some of the treatments into the thyroid component, reiterate some of the things that we've already talked about as far as the thyroid component. And this slide first discusses and highlights really what we've been talking about and that these receptors and this immune attack uh, is waged against many tissues. It's waged against the thyroid, the eyes, and even less commonly and less known, the skin especially the skin around the eyelids that can often become thickened, but more notoriously the skin on the, the shin. And this is, this is called a myxedema, but it's really the same type of deposition of scar tissue and these complex sugar molecules that causes the eyes to bulge, causes the thyroid to often expand, and causes the skin to change. And it's been shown in, you know, that people with Graves' disease ha have different levels of these receptors on all areas of their skin. And it probably affects other components too, just much less obviously. But I think you've seen today why we form a thyroid eye disease center or program, whether that be virtually, but, but maintain these collaborations. And that is, you know, having the input of, of, of a thyroid surgeon, a, a premier endocrinologist, but then also other orbital specialists, such as people who deal only with strabismus, people who deal with health and wellness and nutrition, um, people in nuclear medicine, those the parts of the team you haven't heard from today is so important in the communication because this disease really affects multiple body parts and there is so much confusion. The one thing that I can tell you when I speak to any person with grave disease is there's so much confusion about this disease. And most of it's because, frankly, there's so much heterogeneity. It's like, you know, you can give statistics, but you can't really say, well, this is exactly what's going to happen. This is when it's going to happen. This is why it's going to happen. It's like, well, this could happen, but then this could happen. But, you know, and it's kind of like taking a, a very circuitous road to the top of a mountain, and you're never exactly sure where the next twist and turn is going to come from. But unfortunately, as medical professionals, we don't want to tell you we don't know the next twist and turn. We kind of, you know, we paint a, a standard diagram picture and then everyone wonders what happens when they fall outside of that, that standard diagram, that something must be wrong. Well, no, it's just, it's just biology and the body doesn't always uh, want to adhere to the box that we create. There are several things that are common with Graves' disease and thyroid eye disease, which I'm going to spend most of my time speaking about. And, and just as uh, Dr. Pesh, uh, Dr. Cohen said, it's most commonly associated with Graves' hyperthyroidism. Doesn't mean it always is, but 80% of the time or so it is, and it usually occurs within the first year or 18 months. So they usually occur together. So I, I often use the analogy that thyroid eye disease is kind of like a hurricane because everyone thinks that you know this immune system you know stabilizes or goes into remission and such but i view thyroid eye disease as kind of a hurricane it comes through it happens um, as this active progressive phase where you get all this inflammation and then the inflammation stops the hurricane passes but you're still left with the devastation of what it caused so it doesn't fit, even though the disease goes into quote unquote remission, it doesn't go away. Uh, that you're left with all the damage and the downstream process as far as the eye components and the fibrosis and the bulging and the eyelid retraction and the double vision that this can, this, this can cause. And that you might have another hurricane come through, chances are unlikely it's gonna come through again, less than 4% chance you're gonna get a recurrence of the eye disease. Um, but it can happen. But you know the fact that you know everyone looks on the internet and says, "What well, goes into remission, so it must go away." Well, it doesn't. Um, and so that's one of the things to remember, and one of the things that we're trying to target with new treatments. So you have this inflammatory period, and then you have this what's called the stable phase, or I prefer the non-progressive phase, where things kind of hang out about where they are. And we define these clinically. There's no lab magic laboratory test that says. This is now you're in the active phase and now you're in the stable phase and we treat these differently and there's a lab test that we follow. Unfortunately, it's not that easy 
what you do is we follow you clinically. And frankly, um, we did several of these uh, survey type things of, of actually following this disease to determine, you know, what's to, you know what should we be following. And we, it's called a, it was called a fancy thing, that an idea called a Delphi analysis, where you take everything in the world and you kind of put it together. It's kind of like when you interpret what a piece of art looks like, um, it's kind of trying to break down all those components. And, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But in this, it's like what does thyroid, active thyroid eye disease look like? What does stable look like? What should we be following? And it turned out that there's a few classic things like swelling of the eyelids, redness, change, but change over time was the most important. And you know who was best at determining change over time? And if any, of, any of my patients know that I do measurements, but the first question I ask them is, how do you think you've been doing over the last two or three months? Because frankly, the patient reported um, indication of change. Change over that period of time was far more predictive of true change than than any other measurement. So, so your impression of what's going on with your body is obviously vitally important, and and probably doesn't um, you you probably don't get uh, quite uh, as many people listening to that as they as they should. But that is the most important thing. This eye disease looks um, takes many different forms. It can be, you know, these swollen red eyes that that you just have to love when you wake up. That you know, you're like, why is this happening today? It always happens on a social event, so there's a, there's a high correlation with that. Um, and you know, so you have these swollen blood vessels. You can have swelling up around the upper eyelids, bulging, and is this process is is really tough for patients socially because you just don't you don't want to go outside you don't want to go in public and so many quality of life uh, publications have been shown that this affects people even more severely than having a diagnosis of breast cancer so when when people say oh well, it's just it's just you know it's just a cosmetic issue i i bristle when that, you know because it's not it's actually a life issue uh, that, that really affects every part of someone's life. So our goals of treatment of this eye disease or this eye process are to, have always been to kind of break it into two phases. And that's been the classic way of doing it. It depends on the disease phase. You have this active phase when the hurricane's coming through and the immune system is at its height. And the, bone, the cells from the bone marrow are attacking the thyroid and most likely at the same time that they're attacking those receptors on the um, tissues around the eyes. And the goal in the, clinically in the active phase is usually to make sure that we protect your vision and that we make sure that nothing bad happens first and foremost. And then we can try to give you some medication to improve that. Unfortunately, until more much recently, very recently with a few clinical trials, there's been no medication that's actually shown to dramatically improve the end result of the eye problem. So you can give a high dose steroids, but the question has always been, are you giving more prop, you, you know, you're giving more side effects um, than you're treating? And it's a, it's a balance and often has to be individualized. In the stable phase, we obviously want to protect vision. Five percent of people can go, you know, can lose vision or, or um, have substantial loss of vision with this disease. And we want to reduce the double vision, eye bulging. But we really want to make people back into their normal function and appearance. And I was just meeting with someone the other day, and he said, "Well, how often can you really do that?" And I, I actually think that in anyone who has mild, moderate, or even moderate to severe disease, that in 90% or more patients, we can make people almost as they were before this disease happens. There's just some people where the disease is so severe that you can't. But I'll show you tons and tons of photos that aren't just hand-picked, but they are photos where some people have had a great improvement, some people haven't quite got back. But the surgery it can be very good and can give a new lease. I mean, I'm gonna, the other thing I'm going to talk to you about is the new drugs that may be available, new drug that may be available also. But one of the first things in the active phase is, is treatment of dry eye because you can remember it, you can imagine if the eyes bulge. They don't. The scarring of the eyelids doesn't allow the eyes to close. The simple things are the most important in this stage, and that is lubrication and dry eye therapy. And that can be treatment with just to decrease um, the
the amount of evaporation, you know, which can be at night or during the day. It can be a tear, artificial tear replacement. Sometimes they even use little plugs in the tear drain just to slow the escape of the tears that you naturally produce. And the tears that you naturally produce in Graves' disease are dramatically reduced. And if anyone's noticed dry eye, dry mouth, dry eyes, um, the immune system attacks those glands. It can actually be made worse with a little bit of radioactive iodine too, but the dry eye can be really tough for people. If your eyes don't close at night, there's some night protection, and, and maybe we made a video of this too, and it's on our website. Um, it's, a, it's a messy thing, but for some people it can be a new lease on life because they just can't close their eyes, and their eyes dry out, they get these corneal scars and ulcers. And so sometimes you can put a little bit of Vaseline around your eye and use a little saran wrap, makes an artificial eyelid and you know it takes a few minutes to wash off and wipe off in the morning but sometimes it can be really um, great in the meantime until we can improve this you know potentially surgically so i've talked a lot about um that this disease is different and i think we've each hit upon that that you know that we have you know 80 percent happens this way 70 percent happens that way but everyone is individualized, and you hit it uh, on the nail on the head with the personalized medicine comment of that there is a heterogeneity. There's a heterogeneity of the orbital involvement, like one eye versus not both eyes, mild, moderate, you know, more severe disease, how much inflammation. I look at how much, whether someone has muscle involvement or fat involvement, because someone with very, very bulgy eyes often has an accumulation of fat, which can actually be treated very, very easily. Some people who have less bulgy eyes, but double vision, actually have a very severe form of the disease. It kind of goes undetected, but can actually really affect their vision very profoundly. So it's not always what you see on the surface sometimes that's the most uh, relevant and most important. And then it's like, when will people undergo stabilization? Most people undergo stabilization or that stable phase in about a year. Smokers, on the other hand, and even people with secondary smoke, often does linger for many years and sometimes never reach a, a true stable phase. And so, it, you know, individualizing it into the to social uh, circumstances also is important. And just as Peshwan was talking about, this is an unpredictable course and it's separate from the thyroid for the most part. This disease comes from the bone marrow and the immune system attacking the thyroid and attacking the eyes. And your immune system, you know, if you think, you know, you have to roll five dice with all the same number to get an autoimmune disease. Well, people who are inclined to get an autoimmune disease already have two dice that already have that number and they're, you know, they're rolling less dice. That's kind of the idea here is that you may or may not come up with all five dice that have the same, but you're more likely to than the person sitting next to you. And that's just kind of the way that your immune system is inclined, and we don't really understand all the nuances of that, but that is at least um, an you know, analogy that you, can, you know, that you can kind of use as far as why you get it, but your identical twin may not. Um, it's often just that they throw a difference, you know, the dice just didn't land in that, in that manner. This is just some, some pictures of what, how diverse the eye disease can be. And these are all the patients with all different types and different phases of the disease. But uh, no matter what, I think you, you would say that each of these patients is very much aware of their eyes, is very much aware of their disease going on. So as I said, we use, often use medical treatment in this early initial phase, often have used steroids. I tend not to use many steroids just because this disease will stabilize no matter what. And steroids have not been shown to alter the final outcome. And so, uh, you know, when you have a 40% rate of uh, side effects with using high dose IV steroids, I tend not to use many of them, uh, you know, associated with that. Unless it really is a balance, and we have, I have a very frank discussion with patients as far as what they want to achieve, even if we do use them. And then we've always resorted in the past to surgical treatment in the stable phase. Many patients have said, you know, report to me and said, well, my doctor said I'm just not bad enough. It just doesn't affect me, but it affects every day of my life. It's like, well, it affects every day of your life. It's probably at least worth considering what you can do about it. You may not want to do anything about it when you hear what you have to do, but at least it's worth the consideration and, and for you to make the decision um, and not for someone else to tell you, oh, it's not bad enough. So 
liquid. In summary, this is an autoimmune disease, has extensive scarring and fibrosis, and it leads to permanent facial disfigurement. Um, and the, it's not just the eyes, it's not just tissue around the eyes, it's the eyebrow, it's the tissue around the cheek, it's the tissue in the lower face. So when I approach something surgically or I approach it with the patient, I talk about each of those components because we can do something about each of those components. People's facial shape often changes. They have a much wider lower face instead of a, a more V-shaped face. They usually see the biggest difference in their facial changes and their facial shape, not just their eyes. Their eyes are often are the most obvious, but the people who really understand what this disease does sees the entire effect upon facial shape, and I think the disease really has to be approached that way.